another one, you bastard. Brought to you by Robotoys. More information in a moment. Why do we buy certain toys? Many of the reasons are quite simple to understand. Often people have affinity for certain characters and just want a representation of that fellow on their shelf. Sometimes a company is well known for their engineering prowess, and one is intrigued by the act of flipping it back and forth. Sometimes someone wants a full set of something, and even if a certain character isn't up to the same standard, he'll do for now. Personally, that last one has always bugged me, since I'm always of the opinion that you should probably wait for a better version later down the line, provided it's not a case of voting with your wallet. I made that mistake once and I still regret it. However, recently another reason has been brought to my attention. Buying a toy out of spite. I'm not talking about buying a bad toy of a character because you hate them so much and their awfulness is a humorous insult. Yeah, that's a thing, one of my friends deliberately did that. But no, I'm referring to buying a certain release because another one isn't up to par in a specific way. Haslab Unicron is too kibbly, so I'll buy Zetacron just to show Hasbro how wrong they are. New Age Devastator parts forms too much, so I'll buy the Magic Square version to show Legends companies how to do things. Platinum Edition Ultra Magnus is awful, so I'll buy the original Weaponizer Prime to have a good version of the mold. These might all seem like hypothetical straw man arguments, but these are all reasons I've seen countless times on the internet. Well, the last one isn't exactly. The last one is me. Buying a toy out of spite for another leaves you with an empty feeling, and in many ways it's worse than buying a bad toy, because deep down you'll feel a sense of responsibility for it. So that brings us to Masterpiece MP52, Starscream. In my close to six years on this platform, I have never come across an official Takara Masterpiece this bad. Granted, I haven't handled some of the more egregious examples, but from what I have, this easily takes the cake. However, I still wanted a Starscream. I don't often buy based on character affinity, typically going for which toys actually seem good instead. However, this is a pretty big exception for me. I've always had a soft spot for the traitorous bastard ever since I witnessed his antics on the ancient temple that was the Hasbro website, and I kinda want a Masterpiece version of him in some form. So, is this the right choice here? Have I been duped in my anger towards a truly heinous release? Is there actual quality on show? Well, to answer this, greeting Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today's diagnosis pertains to Deformation Space DS01 Crimson Wings. Or should I say... Kurbian Bao Starscream. Yes, you most certainly heard that right. This technically falls under the banner of Kurbian Bao, with a few degrees of separation. KBB wanted to transition from simple knockoffs to much higher quality ones, so they created Black Mamba. From here, allegedly Black Mamba created Transform Element, and from there, every Chinese seller under the sun classifies Deformation Space under the Transform Element banner. So obviously, they know something we don't at this stage. If I had to hazard a guess, they probably had this design in the works to go along with their Prime, but pulled a Zeta and made a fake company when they wind of MP52. I call this the robot paradise effect. Just you wait, after MP36 and 52, Masterpiece Soundwave 2.0 is totes coming next. Anywho, Kubian Bao Starscream transforms into an approximation of an F15. For copyright reasons, this is an approximation, as is practically every third party Masterpiece figure on the planet. Right off the bat, there is one definitive factor that will make certain fans instantly choose MP52 over this. Jet mode accuracy. This is the first Transformer to ever be properly licensed from Boeing, whereas Crimson Wing is using the same approximation techniques as all previous Masterpiece figures before him, whether official or unofficial. You might think such reasoning is bollocks, but a lot of Transformer fans and general consumers will buy MP52 for that sweet, sweet F15 mode. And you know what? I can understand that. If there's one thing MP52 did well, it was the Jet mode. Fortunately, he comes packaged that way, so the nightmare of the transformation can be avoided entirely. Yes, I am aware of the irony, but don't worry, we'll get there. As for Crimson Wings, this isn't a jet for realistic vehicle fans. It's a jet for fans of the Masterpiece line, and as an approximation of the F15, it does a pretty good job. Funnily enough, it has a lot of the same line work, almost as if they carefully copied it from existing images. Of course, not everything matches up, especially towards the front where it becomes more Transformer Hinge Heidi than Jet Jetty, and there are complete deviations thanks to the lack of the designer's keen eye, such as the lack of asymmetry on the fins. But for the average Masterpiece fan without the big brain vehicle knowledge of the lazy eyebrow reviewer, it'll do just fine. And sure, some of the detail does get lost in this heavily caked on matte grey finish, something which MP52 manages to beat us at pretty easily with its crisp paint job, but if there's one thing Crimson Wings excels at, it's solidity. When holding the two, MP52 feels slightly heavier, but when wobbling the two, DSO-1 stays firm as f**k. 
If you want a jet mode that you can swoosh around without worrying that the panels will come undone, this is the jet to go with. Of course, getting here might be a pain in the ass, but if you're willing to persevere, it's hella solid. Unfortunately, there are a few extra blemishes throughout though, nothing serious and certainly not on the level of the official version's frustrations, but definitely things to take note of. The paint on the wings is less than ideal. The white looks a bit fuzzy and the red doesn't pop as much as it should. It's a bit of a weird effect, it's almost like someone coated jam over the thing, and you can see the grey bleeding through from the cracks. I don't like it, no. Oh, no, I do not. You also unfortunately have to deal with a few ugly hinges on the tail fins, which themselves don't really have a locking point, and as a result have to be nudged into place. I feel they could have engineered these better in a way that keeps them as one solid piece. Something which applies to a lot of elements in Crimson Wings transformation, pun not intended. Finally, the quality control on the paint has been fairly inconsistent. I know it's quite common for third party masterpiece companies to be a little slapdash with their QC, which is one of the reasons I tend to sit out most of the big 3PMP releases. Well, that, and a lot of them look so... Boring. Fortunately, my copy is mostly okay, save for a scratch that mysteriously ended up on the side during transformation, courtesy of the billion steps it entailed. But others have had theirs chipping off like a dehydrated flake bar. Now, if this was one of the defining factors in deciding this or MP52, it's kinda damned either way, since the other contender also chips in robot mode. Can MPs just have solid paint these days? Is it just too much to ask? Still, I reckon in the grand scheme of things, these issues are pretty minor. For the most part, it's a wonderful jet mode. Not as wonderful looking as is a official predecessor, but still pretty nice. And hey, at least this time the goddamn wing articulation works properly, instead of being stopped by useless tooling. And on top of that, the jets at the back are also kind of blast effect compatible. It's pretty loose, so you can tell it wasn't intentional, but eh, I'ma take it. Also, I'm fully aware the official is supposed to be compatible with his blast effects by pulling out the thrusters, but my copy came with his glued in at the factory. Yep, added to the already ridiculously long list of bullshit QC issues. Sadly for Crimson Wings though, there is no stand port. It seems like a pretty hefty oversight and is a massive win for the official version. Kinda messes with your display options for this. For shame. And ultimately, that's the main difference between these two modes. This is a solid and swooshable jet, where Starscream is wibbly as f but looks amazing. I can talk about how awful MP52 is as a toy all day and how categorically you shouldn't waste your money on him, but some people are gonna see it completely differently. So ultimately, Crimson Wing is an alt mode for Transformers fans, whereas MP52 is an alt mode for realistic vehicle fans. Personally, I fall into the former category, so I reckon this newer rendition beats the official out ever so slightly. It's real close, but I always prioritize solidity and functionality when deciding which is better, as opposed to aesthetics. Personally, the only thing I'd really improve is add a stand port and plonk a few grey squares on the top, which are oddly missing. I don't see the other issues as that frustrating. So the win goes to Crimson Wings for me. But beyond that, a few sizes and such. It's slightly bigger than MP52, so either should work in an MP setup, unless you're one of those vehicle mode scale guys who thinks that real life mass shift as possible. Aside from that, the Null Rays pull a similar trick to the Masterpiece, transforming into missiles. The MP1s had a much smoother conversion, but these'll do just fine. And sure, they don't have the struts that allow them to remain on during transformation, since the arms have been jammed into the legs, and such wouldn't be feasible. But I can't give the win to MP52 here on that, since they didn't even work to begin with. So, uh... Point to the MP11, I guess? But yes, this is a pretty good jet mode. If you're just looking for a Starstream that's all around good and has a solid aerial side to him, he'll work quite well. But is it worth the transformation to get here? Now, I haven't handled many transform element figures, but one thing they're apparently known for is their overcomplicated engineering. Yes, not complicated, overcomplicated. Well, I'll be the judge of that, so let's jump in. Or at least we'll jump in after a brief message, because today's video is brought to you by Robotoys. Robotoys is an online toy retailer that is highly regarded by the Aussie Transformers community, covering official and unofficial Transformers in many series. Now unfortunately, as is often the case given my release schedule, Crimson Wings is sadly out of stock, but you can still pre-order Skywarp and Thundercracker at the time of writing this review, and most likely at the time of release. And when you do, don't forget to use the code DOCTORLOCK 10% off at the checkout for a discount on your first order. Well, that is if you want to purchase those in particular. Maybe keep an eye on the transformation. This guy doesn't really have a high bar to jump when it comes to beating out MP50 in the transformation department. MB52's transformation wasn't complicated per se, but it was awful. Absolutely terrible, just fighting with you at every single stage of the way. So obviously it should be easy enough to get over that, right? Well, one small problem. This transformation is a f 
complex one. Probably one of the most complicated Transformers I've come across, and certainly the most complicated I've come across on this channel. I'd say it's more complicated than even Thunder Leader. But does that make him worse than Thunder Leader? Not necessarily. Complex transformations don't have to be bad. Complexity and simplicity don't line up with bad and good. It's just things that can happen. That being said, if you're thinking of purchasing this and you like simple but effective transformations, get the f*** out now. This is not the toy for you. It's not going to give you that. Just forget about it. So, properly getting on with it, many people have claimed that this is a copy of the new Age Seeker design, which is completely false. I don't know how the f*** it came up with that, considering one's a Legends class figure and one's a masterpiece. And upscaling just does not work like that. Even if it did copy it, which it doesn't, it would be absurd. Because the new AC Seeker's arms go into the torso, whereas this one, the arms are tucked away in the legs, which is quite cool, actually. The closest thing I can compare this to is maybe the core class figure, because the chest opens up and closes again. But even then, it's very loose, considering it just opens up this part and doesn't swivel around with the wings like the core class figure does, so not really. Either way, though, this is going to take a f long time. First thing you want to do is close up the landing gear, and yes, he does have foldable landing gear in three places, nice and easy. And you remove the missiles, which are plugged into 5mm ports on the wings. They're a little bit tight, but they're not awful in this particular mode. The only thing that might make getting them out a bit difficult is the fact that these actually are on slight hinges that don't really accomplish much, actually. Could have just ditched those hinges altogether. Anywho, you want to separate the wings over here, like so. Come on out, you get, there you go. Tough. Pretty tight, because they're locked in on these tabs here. You move them up just enough so that you've got a bit of clearance. This bit rotates around 180 degrees, and then you can bring these parts which keep the legs locked in place. They're on double hinges and they move backward. These bits fold down like so, then these bits wrap around like so, wrapping around the wing modules or the side modules there, and then you collapse these around there as well. Not the most elegant transfer but it'll do. These sections open up, which will reveal the arms in there. These sections fold out like so. For some reason, you do get scratching on parts that aren't visible in either mode, but no scratching on parts that are. It's an interesting way of doing things. Good way to avoid the paint chipping, but you want to bring these sections up as well. You come around to the bottom and untab these feet from there as well. These bits pull out a little bit and rotate 180 degrees forward. They're sort of locked in, which is why you have to pull them out like so, and then you can bring that all the way out and you're starting to make some sense of this stuff here. Come around to the front and bring these all the way down until they click into place, which will allow you to slowly move some of this stuff out later. Come under to the bottom and untab these sections here. That will allow you to come over here and pull the backpack section out with this double hinge, and we can work on that a bit later. For now, we can separate the legs like so, take the waist and plug it into place like so, on the double hinge that collapses there. The feet are on sliding rails. Oh boy, my least favorite part of transforming ever, but you unlock them and lock them back in there. That will allow you to bring bring these sections in around the sides. Same with the other side. And on the inside of the legs, you'll notice there's a hook there and a hook there, and that also lines up perfectly. It all lines up like so. It doesn't seem elegant at the time until you get that final click into place, and then it's like, wow, that all works like that, crazy. Anyway, you wanna take this thruster here, and it goes on a double hinge to sit further up into the leg like so. Come around to the front and rotate the entire foot out. Come to the outside and rotate the extra foot there, which will allow you to collapse this double hinge section into there. And then you can rotate this out again and rotate it back into place. Not the most elegant system, and figuring it out does get a bit confusing. I kind of just came across it by accident, especially since the instruction manual for my copy was missing pages, but uh, it's all good. And to finish off the legs, you come around to the sides and you push these little parts here, which are there so that in robot mode everything sits flush. It's a pretty neat step that seems inconsequential, but actually does a lot. And last but not least for the legs, you bring in the double hinges to bring the knees into place like so. And you can then rotate the legs however you wish. From here, things start getting a bit weird. The torso section back here is probably the most annoying part of this, but I still don't think it's the worst thing on the planet. There are some clearance issues, don't get me wrong, but it's not terrible. This section will rotate around 180 
degrees, so you get a bit more space there. And you can bring these sections up a bit now that everything started wiggling out of place and that goes up and that starts to rotate around and such. But before we can do anything else, my least favorite part of the transformation, you have to get these tiny little panels out and they just kind of sit to the side wherever. I just, why the f*** would you do that? You couldn't fit those in any better way. These tiny pieces basically serve no purpose except making a transformation really difficult. That's the one thing I will call this out for. A lot of these things, yeah, I kind of get it with the complexity. But that, that's just f***ing stupid. Might as well work on the nose cone though because it will make things a bit easier later on. You want to start separating that from there which will then bring this whole thing into what looks like a mess but trust me, it'll make sense. Open up the cockpit like so. Bring this section up just a little bit so that you can separate the nose cone so that everything unhinges. Come on, there we go. Now these are on double hinges but we're only going to use the first hinge for now. What you want to do is rotate these 90 degrees, bring them around, another 90 degrees into place. So they're rotating 180 degrees in total, but you have to do it in a bit of a weird way. A bit annoying there, I will say. Anyway, now that part should move up like so, and these bits should be able to move fully out of the way now that that's out of the way. And then this section should be able to move down over the bottom there. You do want to keep these sections out a bit though, because on the side here, there are tiny little panels that won't go out all the way just yet, just a little bit of the way, but that'll give you enough clearance to start moving this whole thing out and over each other and the whole thing should fall apart in the process. What you're doing is really turning this section 180 degrees and look they've got the same head springy gimmick from the masterpiece version probably just a coincidence though stand up please stand up anyway now that that's done these bits can fully rotate out you push this section as far as it'll go and then just try to get this around it's a little bit annoying but eventually you should get it there nice and easy then after that you take that bit and push it back in geez this piece has moved a lot and then you can bring that in and then this part can go the rest of the way with these parts folding onto the side and these parts folding there and the whole torso just sitting down on to the ab crunch and it all clicks in nicely and you can see it start to line up for now but we got to do the torso next so you want to bring this up a little bit this part is on a hinge and oh joy another sliding rail except this sliding rail kind of makes sense i don't mind this one so you just gotta push that down into the torso come on f now then that'll finally be able to push up and such and then you come to the torso and bring these front sections out it's a bit similar to one of the steps on the masterpiece except this does it much better and the whole torso clicks together it's one of the aha moments and i really love it that's a very nice but now we gotta deal with all of this shit, all right i gotta show you it's way easier off camera it's not a big problem off camera at all the main issue is that these bits all have to rotate upwards like that and then you sort of have to get these around after the fact. But firstly, these bits have to get around 180 degrees, so you want to do that, bring it around, start rotating it around and into place like that. It's best if you keep these done around the back here. It's a bit more annoying if it's being done the other way to vehicle mode, but here it's not terrible. So now you've got the arms on the outsides as opposed to the insides, and now you can use these double hinges to bring it out and rotate it out. That'll give you enough clearance to get everything into place. So you're seeing what's happening here. This part is clashing against this, but with the extra hinge, it gets enough clearance to go out and get into place. And you got this big ass back section here that should rotate into place as well. You might have to bring the backpack out a bit first, but yeah, that just nice and locks into place. And we're starting to get a really clean backpack. And now you move these sections back into place on those double clicks and such. Using those hinges again, you can now bring these sections down and straighten them out so that this whole section comes into place. Same with the other side. Come on, come on, come on. Around you go. For these collarbone sections, you want the head up as far as possible. That rotates into place. And these sections kind of get over and lock the whole thing together nice and solidly. Marvelous. Absolutely marvelous the way it just clicks into place. Just Jesus, so clever. Anyway, from here, you can sort of bring the backpack around and bring the wings into place however you like. Come around to the back and rotate these sections down so you get that nice star scream silhouette and of course keep changing things around so that it all works nicely. As Bobby Skullface would put it, cleaning it up and taking a look. You come to the bottom and this section is sort of on the double hinge here. You want to separate that and the whole thing should just push underneath and clip into place like so. And keep the legs straight. They have this weird double hinge section here that doesn't make much sense but whatever. Last but not least, come around
down to the arms, bring it around, fold out the fists, keep them clicked into place with the part there, and the same on the other side. The simplest hand fold out trick in the Masterpiece playbook. Nothing special there, but it doesn't need to be because it just does it fine. And now that we have Starscream done, we have one more thing to do with the Null Rays. You might think, oh, it untabs at the top here, but no, it actually untabs at the bottom, and it's pretty tight. Like, getting it out is a bit difficult. But this hinges on two separate hinges and folds all the way out. That'll give you enough clearance to rotate it around 180 degrees and then clip back into place. And then you extend it a little bit as well. Again, the Masterpiece version does this a lot smoother, but if this is the one thing that this guy does a little bit worse, I'll take it. They do the job just fine. The only real problem is that they are absurdly tight in robot mode. And I don't want to sand it down because then that'll make the vehicle mode a bit difficult. And you can even hear it going, it's not good. You just gotta be gentle, gentle getting it in there. But eventually you do get it in there, and you just push and push and push, and it works just fine. Come on, that's not getting a bit further as well. There we go. And holy sh**, that was a pretty long transformation on camera, but off camera, not so much. I can probably do it in around seven minutes off camera, but on camera it's taken 20 because I have to talk and explain things and also keep things in the shot. But you know, it's not a heinous transformation, but it is complicated. It's not for everyone. Of of course, I probably should stop elaborating here and leave the elaboration to the script portion because uh, this does need a little bit of context and such. So looking through all of this, the transformation seems pretty complex, right? To some people, it may even seem headache inducing thanks to the sheer number of steps at play. I'm not gonna deny that it is a heavy process. And let me tell you, if you despise complex transformations and take comfort in the simple but effective bailout now, this transformation isn't trying to be your friend. And if you expect it to be going in, you're gonna have a bad time. It's complex to the point where I can safely say that if you're buying this for the jet mode, don't even bother. Just buy a model kit. Going through this process just for that isn't the best judgement here. That said, is it actually a bad transformation? I mean properly bad, not just not suited for certain types of collectors. Many reviewers will claim such, saying this is pure evil distilled into engineering form. If you want the majority opinion, then yes, it could be considered a bad conversion. However, if there's one thing I'll always try to be, it's honest about the way I feel on things. With all the steps it takes and even with a few of those clearance conundrums, I still don't dread transforming this guy. Yeah, I know it'll take a while, but I honestly don't mind it even a month later. Compare that to MP52, who's technically less complex. Even with fewer steps on show, I f hate transforming this thing. When brainstorming this video, I wasn't dreading transforming Crimson Wings, but rather MP52. It's not about whether a figure is complex or not. Complex figures can be good or bad, as can simple ones. The best example of this is the difference between Revenge of the Fallen Leader Optimus and Wei Jiang Thunder Leader. At the base level, these conversions are pretty similar, but under the surface you have to fight against Thunder Leader to transform it, whereas 2009 Prime is a puzzle. In a similar vein, Crimson Wings is also a puzzle, the kind that would make a certain professor's jaw drop in astonishment. Take it slow, work things out, trust that there's an order of operations at play. That is where the brilliance lies in Crimson Wings' transformation. The more you put in, the more surprise it gives back. But of course, that's just my view, and apparently I'm the only person on the planet who thinks like this. According to everyone and their mother, the transformation is the worst thing since sliced mass toys, and you're only really buying this for the robot mode. Yeah, sure, you do you. At least if you are going for the robot mode, there's still a lot to get excited for. Now, accuracy takes many forms, but a large portion of people are looking for one-to-one -one proportions and line work. If you're going for that, once again, 99% of this ain't it, Chief. Crimson Wings is not Sunbow accurate in his proportions and line work. At all. He's not quite into the fully stylized end of the spectrum, but you can tell they've made him a lot boxier than his El Cheapo animation counterparts. This is something that MP52 has in spades, because that's what Takara is going for thanks to all those mail-in surveys that the rest of the world doesn't have access to. This isn't a criticism, this is a statement. If you're criticizing the aesthetic for any reason, accuracy doesn't come into the argument because one of these isn't going for that at all. It's made sacrifices to ensure that the bot mode remains solid, so the priorities are completely different. Now that being said, there is one exception to this. One place where it doesn't just end up looking more accurate, but also much better in the long run. The head sculpt is absolute sex. Now granted, he doesn't come with as many face sculpts as the original, but what he lacks in quantity, he makes up for with quality, as well as solidity since these actually stay on. But bringing it back, this face actually feels like G1 Starscream. No longer must you deal with washed out 
and rounder detail that makes the plastic look half melted. The head is crisp and clean, as well as full of personality in a way MP52 could only dream of. This actually really surprised me, since typically it's the other way around. Aside from copyright issues that tend to force faces to deviate from the original, so many third-party faces end up looking awful, including those in Transform Elements catalog. To have this smirking bastard properly carry across his personality is an absolute joy. This has an interesting domino effect on the rest of the figure. Often a well-designed Transformer with a lackluster head will end up in a much less forgiving analysis than one with a lackluster body and a killer face. What I mean to say is, if you get the head sculpt right, it allows you to be far more lenient on the rest of the figure. Not that Crimson Wings needs it though, because as far as being a boxier interpretation of Screamer, he does so pretty damn well. The chest sculpt looks positively gorgeous, with its slightly angled thruster boxes and awesome paint picking out the details on the side. I know why mine was splattered in gold paint though, third party QC can be weird at times. Now admittedly, I am a little biased towards this aesthetic. I'll happily take fixed proportions over 100% Sumbo accuracy any day, but as far as this aesthetic works, they've pulled it off extremely well. And look at this, way swivel! Honestly, I shouldn't be getting this excited over such a simple articulation point, but given Haztac's track record, this is such a breath of fresh air. And sure, it does split as a result, but honestly, who cares? That complaint wasn't ever a thing until MP52 came out. I've never heard of it being used once! I'm nearly positive it was just made up to justify MP52's existence, and I'm tired of it being used as a crutch for this f Thing. Of course, the rest of the articulation works pretty damn well too, with one exception that's honestly not too big of an issue. Sure, you no longer have forward foot pivots or the insane upward shoulder movement, but the core stuff is still here, and you still get the butterfly joint. And, hello, waist swivel, something so simple shouldn't be overlooked. Plus, at least this time the feet actually stay in place, so I'm happy to sacrifice the forward motion if it means you can actually stand properly. Of course, that solidity isn't all-encompassing. Sadly, the ab crunch is woefully loose. I don't really want to tighten it since it might stress the plastic a bit, the materials sadly aren't as good as main line or old masterpiece. I mean, sure, they're better than MP52, but let's be real here, that's not saying much. As for the ab crunch, it's unfortunate, but not that annoying, considering everything else works. And hey, the wings actually rotate this time. F Brilliant! Also, fun fact, I apparently mistransformed the wings on MP52 last time, which made me think it was supposed to have at least some backward motion. Turns out they're supposed to lock in 100%! No functionality for you, f -quit. Seriously, something like this on a Masterpiece Seeker is so simple, yet completely cast aside in an effort to force the toon silhouette onto people who might want other functionality. It's intrusive engineering, and I'm glad to have a Starstream that actually respects the consumer's desire for options. Hell, they've even done a better job on the fingers. They retain the same level of posability as the original, but this time they look good in practically any pose. Again, it's the little things like this that make it clear this was a work of passion as opposed to a corporate cash grab designed to fill a hole in the market. Not saying that's what MP52 was though, MP52 was a completely different kind of disaster. This is why I think this design was in production long before the official version was announced. Aside from the impossibility of designing it in such a short time frame, nothing here feels rushed, save for maybe some of the QC owned copies other than my own. Still, all this explains why he's better than MP52, which to be honest isn't a high bar to jump. That said, is he still good in this mode on his own? Absolutely. The proportions are heroic, but not to the point where it diminishes his personality. He's stable in any pose thanks to pretty good balancing. He's well articulated and really well painted. Yes, some of that paint causes problems in the transformation, like with the null rays, but for the most part, it's pretty durable. It's just a solid star screen, plain and simple. Also, faux part haters will be pleased to know that the chest is 80% real. Personally, I don't mind either way, but hey, some people will be into it. If I had to think of any real complaints, the only substantial one outside of the wonky ab crunch would be some of the plastic choices. This figure doesn't use the best plastic on the market. It's soft and in certain places looks a smidge cheap. It isn't cheap by any means, as although it feels lighter than the official overall, this is one solid figure. Crimson Wings ain't gonna fall apart anytime soon. But yes, fortunately most of the body is painted in a fairly durable light grey, in a slightly lighter shade to MP52. Sadly though, the red plastic wasn't afforded such. Probably for the best, since these parts are the most likely to get scratched. But still, certain bits look pretty cheap, especially the shoulder spikes. They almost look see-through thanks to the reflections of the screws at times. When it comes to masterpiece figures, aesthetics are a very important part. They need to look fantastic on a shelf, as well as be well engineered and built. Still, if I had to choose one place to fall short in, aesthetics would be it every time. At the end of the day, this Starscream is solid as f and that's why it works for my collection very well. Sure, there will always be reasons to buy MP52, not good reasons, mind you, like the fact Crimson Wings is slightly taller, booting him out of the Sumbo chart by a centimetre or two, but reasons nonetheless. However, in terms of the whole package, he's a definite winner. The designers understood the assignment and put their minds in the places that mattered. Yes, he sacrifices accuracy in a few areas, and some people will be bummed out, but as a result, both modes remain rock solid, and, mate, that's gotta 
account for something. But this brings us back to the original question. Why do we buy toys, and why should we buy them? I know a bunch of people will either end up with MP52, get buyer's remorse, and swap out for Crimson Wings, or see the shit show that is MP52 and buy Crimson Wings just to stick it to the man. Yes, stick it to the big corporation by buying from a company so small it doesn't even show up on Takara's radar. Third party isn't as big as you think, bud. Stop it. My point is, this figure knows what it's trying to do, and it does it well, but it's not a Starscream I can recommend to absolutely everyone. There are people who will adore this, and there are people who will hate this. I can safely say that this is a very good figure, but whether it belongs in your collection depends. If you are buying this for the robot mode, and only the robot mode, with no intent to transform it, then it is a safe bet. If you are buying this for the jet mode, and only the jet mode, with no intent to transform it, this isn't the figure for you. Well, I wouldn't recommend MP52 either, so really your only option is a model kit or taking a gamble on the Make Toys one. Can't speak for it since my acid storm keeps getting delayed. If you are the type who likes to play with their figures and enjoy simple transformations, get the f*** out of here. Crimson Wings ain't about that sh**. It'll give you a migraine. However, if you're like me and enjoy puzzling transformations that impress you to no end, then I'd say he's a worthy pickup. However, all of these have one thing in common. These are personal reasons to buy him. The key point is this. Do not buy Crimson Wings because MP52 is terrible. We got dealt a bad hand with the latest official Starscream auction. Okay, fine. Still doesn't mean you need to rush out and buy one to fill your collection. If you're pissed at MP52, whether through owning it or through fandom osmosis, and you're not sure about Crimson Wings, give it some time. This figure may not be for you. If it is, and you're certain, fantastic, I'm sure you'll love him. Personally, I'm just a few millimeters from loving him, but he is still ruddy good. But if you have doubts, just give it some more thought. I'm constantly seeing people purchasing this in protest, and that just seems short-sighted to me. This is Starscream we're talking about. Someone will make a better version later down the line. One with a smoother transformation and articulation that blows current engineering out of the water. But for now, if you're not happy with any of the options, maybe hold off. I bought this because I thought it looked rad. I'm happy with this, and I'm not going for the other two because Thundercracker looks wonky, and if I get Skywarp, I'll probably coerce myself into getting Thundercracker. I ain't going down a second Seeker rabbit hole, no thank you. I'm not typically the kind of guy who reviews things as soon as he gets them. The first week at least is considered the honeymoon phase, where that new toy feeling hasn't quite eased off. It takes at least a couple of weeks to truly get into a figure and determine whether its hype is worth it or not. I see a lot of people declaring this the greatest G1 Starscream to ever grace the fandom, and I'm not sure if that's really the case. I feel part of that is a result of putting MP52 in the rear view mirrors, and not giving Crimson Wings time to sit in fandom public consciousness. He's a remarkable piece, sure, but in the end, I keep getting brought back to one key question. Ultimately, that question is something you'll have to ask yourself, as I did prior to pre-ordering. I wanted this figure for what it did in the end. Can you say the same? Please don't take this out of context and think I hate it. He's great, not perfect, but great. If you like me, you'll probably have fun, but think, damn it, think!